Welcome back to AP World Simplified, and today we'll be talking about the classical empires of Persia, Rome, and China. Now what separates these three and other empires from the previous period are going to be the way they centralize and administer their governments. Beginning with the Persian Achaemenid Empire in roughly 550 BCE, Cyrus the Great is going to conquer most of Mesopotamia, Egypt, up into Anatolia, and all the way up into about the Indus Valley region, uh, expanding a massive amount of territory that no other empire until that time had conquered. These conquests were so large, in fact, that roughly half of the world's population came under direct control of the Persians at this time. Now while the extent and population that was under control is impressive, the impressive thing is not so much how big the empire was, but how they ran the empire and how successfully they ran the empire. The Persians are going to start what is called a centralized government, and that is a government run from an, an imperial capital, in this case of Persia that's going to be Persepolis, and that imperial capital is going to be the cultural, administrative, political, religious, and militaristic center uh, of the complete empire. And what's ironic about Persia and the following empires is that people that are conquered by the Persians are actually going to be better off than they were before. Previously, most areas were ransacked, pillaged, pulled for slaves, many people killed, um, even you know removed like the Jewish people were uh, from Mesopotamia. And the Persians are gonna make their overall society more economically successful and, and safer uh, with an organized political system and, and, and rule of law, essentially, that are going to bring stability and prosperity to the peoples conquered by the Persians. Now, while the Persians will maintain that sort of divine connection with the heavens, as considering emperors like Cyrus the Great, Darius, and Xerxes as god kings, uh, the cultural center uh, and religious center and Persepolis is also going to be the administrative center. What I mean by that is they're going to make the rules uh, and essentially uh, collect all the taxes from the surrounding empire, but being as large as it is, one particular imperial city cannot administer control over that large of an area. What the Persians are gonna do, and this is something we still use to this day, uh, is a system of officials known as satraps that act like governors. Now these satraps are going to be essentially the governing body in that region throughout Persia. And these satraps are going to report to the imperial city. So any orders coming from the imperial city, whether it be the emperor or whoever, uh, they're going to be enforced in these local areas by the satraps. And the satraps are also uh, in, in are responsible for administering uh, control and peace of these areas. So for example, if there's a rebellion, it's up to the satrap and their officers uh, to handle it. And if they need to require, if they require aid, they can call for, from the surrounding satraps or from the central government back in Persepolis. And along with those satraps are gonna come a complex system of bureaucrats. Bureaucrats meaning people that essentially keep track of information in the empire. They're the ones that determine how many people are in a certain area, what languages are spoke, they provide the translators for those people, they collect the taxes for those people, and and they keep the entire empire essentially accounted for uh, and make sure that the revenue, the tax revenue, is flowing towards the capital city to uh, work on infrastructure projects uh, or military conquest. As far as infrastructure goes, the Persians are also going to be one of the first empires to establish the beginnings of a road network. Now, while these road networks aren't going to be as developed as, say, the following Roman empires, uh, the Persian road system is going to attempt to provide safer and quicker transportation between its main cities, particularly towards Persepolis. They're also going to organize the first mailing system, which is going to be a more organized, quicker, and efficient form of communication going between these satraps and other areas, uh, connecting, at least communicatively, uh, the empire somewhat before we had, of course, you know, much more complex mailing systems or electronic communication. Additionally, economic prosperity is going to increase because the Persians are going to start developing minted coins, which are standardized coins of a particular size and weight that are gonna allow for much easier and quicker transactions between people who no longer have to barter uh, and trade things that are of questionable value. And perhaps lastly, the Persians are going to be remarkably tolerant, uh, at least compared to the previous empires, in allowing peoples to maintain their cultures and religions and languages. And that's going to provide a significantly larger amount of stability as opposed to the previous empires that would usually uh, apply their own views uh, or cultures or religions uh, by force to the conquered peoples. Now, while this is going on in Western Asia, uh, Eastern Europe, and North Africa, in China, at roughly the same time, we're we're going to have the Qin Dynasty arise out of a period of warring and chaos and destruction called the Warring States Period from roughly the 5th century uh, to the uh, late 3rd century BCE. Now this Warring States Period was a period of time characterized by many different states within China after the dissolving of the Tzu Dynasty where 
each state was vying and fighting for power. Uh, there was no essential centralized state that was controlling the peoples of China. So it was a particularly chaotic time filled with disease, famine, war, destruction, uh, economic uh, degradation, and all sorts of negative aspects that the Chinese people were ready to sort of get rid of. Now, coming out of that Warring States period, uh, the Qin state, or the Qin dynasty led by Qin Shi Huangdi, are going to be particularly concerned with law and order. So they're going to administer and apply a form of Chinese philosophy known as legalism, which strictly emphasizes law and order with specific laws, rewards, and punishments, and extreme central control. Some might say too extreme, as this clearly led to what would eventually become the fall of the Qin Dynasty about 16 years later uh, to the Han. Now, while the Qin did not last long, that focus on legalism and strong central control with law and order is going to be a primary focus of the Chinese following that Warring States period. But also, in addition to those that, that form of legalism that's provided by the Qin state. Uh, they're also going to provide a lot more economic and social control coming from that particular capital. In this case, it would be Xing'an. Now, what the Qin are going to do is they're going to, much like the Persians and later Romans, are going to organize the state uh, around a central authority. And that central authority is going to be in charge of managing economic and infrastructure projects, such as the building of walls, which would later be in the northern border, which would later become the Great Wall of China. They're going to take competing elites who were previously fighting bring them to the capital and incorporate them, uh, take a much more proactive uh, uh, grasp of the peasantry uh, and as far as utilizing them for economic and military purposes. The Qin Dynasty is also going to be responsible for forming the first universal Chinese writing as well as developing an infrastructure and road system uh, similar to what the Persians would be. Now while the Qin were carving out their state in Eastern Asia, the Romans were built, busy building their empire as well in the Mediterranean. Starting in roughly the 6th century CE, uh, the Latin city-state of Rome is going to expand uh, and control the surrounding Latin uh, city-states in the Italian peninsula. Now while the AP test isn't nearly as concerned with Rome's military conquest, it is per important to at least know the sort of order of events that led to the expansion of Rome, and then we'll talk more about the actual AP content, which is more about the uh, militaristic um, structure, as well as society um, and problems that plagued the Roman Empire. Now, Rome did first start out as a republic with a senate, and they're going to expand beyond this Italian peninsula into what is now modern-day France, formerly known as Gaul, Spain. They're also going to conquer the surrounding islands and colonies that were settled by the Phoenicians and Greeks. The Romans are also going to come into conflict with their main rivals in the Western Mediterranean the state of Carthage. In a series of fairly brutal wars known as the Punic Wars, the Romans are going to suffer heavy casualties, but they will ultimately emerge victorious and control the Western Mediterranean. What's left in their path is what is formerly known as the Hellenistic Empires or the Hellenistic States. After conquering Macedonia and later Egypt and into the Levant, uh, Rome would eventually expand to incorporate all of the Mediterranean uh, calling it essentially the Roman lake, uh, expanding also further into northern Europe, up into England, uh, and as far south as what would become later Axum uh, in the upper or lower portion, portions of the Nile in Egypt. Now that Roman Republic would continue to about 27 BCE until a Roman general known as Julius Caesar would take over Rome uh, and begin the Roman Empire uh, with rule as the Caesar. Now this Roman Empire is actually going to last substantially longer, going till in the east anyway, so about 1453 uh, CE. So the expanse of this Roman Empire, starting from its early conquest of the Latin city-states all the way till its fall in the east, which is actually to the Greeks, by the way, in the Byzantine Empire, is going to be almost 2,000 years long. Now, Roman society was run essentially uh, somewhat like an oligarchy. Now, there was the emperor at the top making all of the, the calls, especially after 27 BCE, but the ruling class, uh, the elite class, were called the Patricians. And these were um, an, an exclusive, born-in elite class that had a tremendous amount of wealth and power. Now, while valuable to the Roman Empire, these patricians would eventually be a, a root cause in their downfall as to maintain their loyalty, the state of Rome would give them many tax benefits and exemptions uh, that would later erode the ability of the Romans to fund their military conquests. Another problem would be the issues that were brought up uh, and fought for by the classes below the patricians known as the plebs and the slave classes. Now the plebs or plebeian class were the more regular citizens and as time went on, as has 
been every empire uh, in history, more and more wealth began to uh, cycle towards the top. And that, of course, leaves more and more displaced people in the plebeian class or the slave class that have essentially nothing. And when you have essentially nothing, you have essentially nothing to lose uh, as far as trying to overthrow the current political system. So Rome had its fair share across 2,000 years um, of, of slave rebellions. Um, one example could be the Spartacus Rebellion in 73 BCE that sort of crippled Rome uh, as this um, gladiator-led slave rebellion ran around the Italian peninsula for a couple of years, um, essentially paralyzing Rome and, and Roman conquest. Now, while these slave rebellions would not be the ultimate overthrow of the Roman Empire, it would dramatically weaken them as it costs a lot of money and time to bring your army back and put down these rebellions. Rome's military, however, was extremely efficient, and it was efficient at conquering and holding on to, uh, essentially, other states and chunks of land. Now, the Roman legions were uh, funded by the Roman Empire, but you could include any other people that were added along the way as far as people that were conquered. Uh, this is known as Roman citizenship. Becoming a Roman citizen entitled you to also to fight in the Roman army. And the Roman army was a particularly beneficial profession because being put into and trained in this army, you were rewarded with land uh, that was won as a result of the conquest of the Roman Empire. So settling in as a soldier, if you survived anyway, would mean later on a, some sort of reward in the form of usually land uh, that you could live off of and, and, and function as a sort of farmer or other, or other sort of patron. As the Roman Empire expanded more further and further east into northern Europe and further east into Asia against the Persians, they would experience uh, difficulty supplying uh, their troops that were further and further and further away from Rome and the Mediterranean. Uh, the Romans used supply lines and forts to provide uh, protection at the boundaries and protection for these supply lines, but ultimately Rome would essentially become too large to uh, manage itself. Uh, the conquests would stop, therefore the rewards and incomes from these conquests would, would begin to halt. Uh, you'd have invasions and rebellions uh, inside and on the boundaries of the Roman Empire, and ultimately these processes would over time weaken and shrink the Roman Empire. Rome would also be weakened by other invasions by Germanic tribes and Huns, as well as the spread of disease, such as the diseases of uh, Antonin and the plague of Justinian, all factors would sort of accrue over time uh, to weaken slowly the and shrink the Roman Empire. Now, while the Roman Empire would expand and slowly decline in that manner, the Romans were actually extremely efficient, efficient at maintaining peace within their empire. In fact, there was a period of time known as the Pax Romana in which Rome essentially amplified the prosperity uh, and peace within the Mediterranean world for about 200 years. Um, one of the re reasons why it was allowed to economically prosper was the advanced Roman road network uh, and trade network established within this Roman Empire. Um, that road network would connect all major cities uh, around the entire Mediterranean uh, to any sort of ports uh, or Rome itself. They also are going to be uh, substantially increasing the amount of trade that's happening within the empire by connecting to other areas such as the Han Dynasty in China along the first Silk Roads uh, through pastoral traders in the Central Asian steppes. Uh, and also you're going to have uh, a sense of protection brought by Rome that allows people to not worry so much about fearing for their city or their state's lives uh, as more as providing for their families in a much more peaceful environment that is somewhat controlled and protected under a, a, a form of Roman law. Now this Roman law started here in the classical era would be one of the first forms of civil law, which is a form of law that attempts to sort of make a legal system, not one run by hierarchies or religious traditions so much as one that's a uh, its own sort of profession or school of thought uh, with systems of writing uh, and codes, such as the Code of Justinian later on, uh, that would form a, a very strict but clear form of common law to all Roman citizens. Administering these laws, just like the Persians, would be governors that were responsible for conflicts uh, and uprisings in their area, and they could call for aid from Rome or surrounding areas as well, but they were also provided with a system of bureaucrats and tax collectors and translators that would help to um, keep track of the empire and help have it run more efficiently and smoothly than any empire had uh, before. And the last portion that we care about, at least in terms of the AP test, are going to be Rome's um, approaches towards uh, women. Now, patriarchy at the time was universal in, in the world, essentially. And in Rome, while patriarchy is still 
definitely going to be maintained, there are going to be some advances as far as the rights of women go. And what I mean by that is women are going to gain under the Roman Empire across time uh, some access to property rights that were previously not enjoyed. And one of the clearest indicators of this valuing of female lives under the Roman Empire is going to be laws that specifically prevent husbands from arbitrarily killing their wives as their own property like they would for a slave. Now while there's a lot more detail that could be provided about Rome or Persia or the Qin Dynasty, that's all you really need to know about as far as the AP test goes. On the next episode, we're gonna be talking more about the start of these classical era religions uh, and then also responses to these religions. And don't forget, if you would like access to all of my videos about all AP World topics or other tools for AP students or teachers, be sure to check out my website at morganapteaching.com. Thanks for watching.